welcome. I'm a huge subscriber to your series, and uh, I just, I just keep trying to join because each one of you, you know, you're handpicked perfectly placed exactly where you should be tonight. So uh, put on your seatbelts because I'm sure the Lord's got something in store for each one of you. And uh, if you are, if you're able, then could you stand and worship the King with us? It's on my mind, but I just can't win this fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Ashes in the wind. So, so long, my old friend. Burden and bitterness, you can just keep on moving. Now you ain't welcome here. From now till I walk. Because he healed my heart and he changed my name forever. 
Yeah, you gotta say this out loud. You gotta yell it out. You gotta own it. Are you with me? Hallelujah! Hill lost another one, and I am free. I am free. I am free. Hill lost another one, and I am free. I am free. Come on, declare it. I am free. Hill lost another one, and I am free. I am free. I am free. Hill lost No, Jesus didn't stay on the cross, and then he didn't stay in the grave. He rose, he ascended. If you want to tell you the grave, I'm walking too. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. Following Jesus. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. Come on. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. If you walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. I'm following Jesus. You walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. Oh shame. Oh shame in the prison. It's cruel as the grave. Shame is a robber, but coming to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no pain. When I hold my body down, oh, there ain't no pain. No, gonna hold.
Now this is really important, listen. Johnny Cash wrote that. Did you know that? No. Yes, he wrote that song. And, you know, he sang it to the guys in jail. <laughs> and there is no grave. They're going to hold you down if you want to walk with the Lord, yes? So I just want to share a quick story with you, if you don't mind. And that is that, um, because we're going to sing Reckless Love, and I want to just tell you that when I was, uh, when I was addicted, to crystal meth. I was looking for the Jesus of power. I knew there was a God of power, okay? I knew that. But I, um, I couldn't find him. And I went to all the churches, and I was running from church to church, and they weren't open, and I was knocking on doors. And I was like, I was like, so I, just, I just desperately, I just desperately needed him, the God of power. The one that could actually help me. And I realized that while I was running looking for him, he was actually running after me. He was running after me. I was, I was running after him, trying to find him, 
But the whole fact that I was even running after him was because he was running after me. You see, you can't seek God out unless he's already put it on your heart. So that means he's already desiring you. He's already running after you. And there's nothing he won't do to reveal himself to you if you're willing. So he found me, I found him. <laughs> and oh my gosh, the journey I've been on, and the Lord has, has, has healed me, healed my family, helped, healed my mind. Don't tell me that God can't heal your mind. God can heal your mind. If you have depression, if you have like bipolar or whatever they want to label it, God can heal it. Heal it. God heals my mind like a big ticking on the clock. The Lord just heals me. So I just want you to know that God is more than able. God's arm is not too short. God seeks, he finds, delivers, and he doesn't leave you. He doesn't forsake you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Before I spoke a word, it was singing over me.
There's no shadow you won't light up. Now you won't come up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. The lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Now you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no Amen. Well, let's uh, let's give it up for the band one more time. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Jesus said, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." So, welcome to Saturday Night Light. My, <laughs> my name is Chris, and I'll be your host tonight. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. SNL is a ministry of Northridge Church. 
We are all welcome to experience everything that Northridge has to offer. After tonight, we meet Sunday morning and look forward to seeing you again. If you have kids, ask someone about the different free programs and activities that we offer during the week. Northridge and SNL are proud to partner with Hope for Freedom Society. And we're Again, Hope for Freedom Society. We are big fans of this ministry and count ourselves fortunate to work alongside them this way. And is anyone here for the first time from Hope for Freedom Society? Oh, welcome. Um, let's see. Celebrate Recovery is a place to experience freedom from life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. We have a group that meets Friday nights just down the road at Sunrise Church. There are CER groups all over the world. If you know what you're going to be, where you're going to be moving to, want to know more about how to connect, just let us know. Or John, you're still connected to some of the guests there. Yeah, just let John know; he'll help you. Hi, John. Oh, welcome back, John. Uh, we would like to celebrate recovery here at Saturday Night Life. If you are comfortable sharing where you're at in your recovery, take a moment, stand, and share your milestone. It would be helpful to someone else. Thank you. That's awesome. oh. I was looking at Danny. <laughs> Danny, do you want to share a milestone today? <laughs> Maybe next time. <laughs> Danny's at five months too. Yeah. Sixty days, awesome. Wow. Mike, and I got five months too. Yeah. Yeah. Where am I at? Uh, coming on three months. Uh, thank you. Uh, you version. Take the Bible with you wherever you go. You version has a Bible app for your phone. You have, does anyone have the app here? Just one? Oh. You have it? Danny has it. Oh. <laughs> well, when you get your phone back, take the Bible with you wherever you go. You version has a Bible app for your phone. Check it out next time you have access to your phone. Um, if you don't have access to a hard copy oh, of the Bible, we have one just for you. Feel free to visit our new kiosk by the coffee and take your pick. And the new tradition of handing out Bibles. These are two small New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. If anyone wants to have Proverbs everywhere you go. Oh, we have one taker down here. Gideon, one of the knees. This one? Oh. Both have Proverbs. Well. Fast sellers. Um, so all of our SNL services are streamed live on Facebook. Um, hello, everyone, our, our vast audience watching at home. <laughs> everyone can watch the replay on YouTube or Spotify. If you're watching online right now, stay connected by liking, following, or subscribing so that you never miss a service. Not yet, but soon. Um, we serve coffee because we want to encourage you to linger and hang out. Make sure you refill your cup and enjoy a conversation. And free clothing shop. Take some time to check out our free clothing available for you tonight. It has brought, been brought especially for you, so don't be shy. Take as much as you want. Michael today is wearing a... It's got a an Under Armour shirt with some pants and a hat, all gone from the free clothing shop. If you want to turn around? You can look just like Mike. <laughs> just like Mike. Um, 
Also, Massimo is homesick tonight, so let's keep him in our prayers. And hello, Massimo, if you're watching online. Um, and we like to capture images sometimes here. If uh, you're not okay with that, talk to Pastor David, and we'll take care of that. Um, Massimo's not here. And once again, we are very glad you're here. And uh, if you got your Bible or your new version or one of your new versions, open up to the book of John and get ready to learn a little bit more about Jesus. I'd like to introduce Pastor David. Thank you very much. New version or the new version. I like that. That's, that's good. And I think the only other thing we've got to do is we've got to coordinate like fashion, whatever fashion music is. Like have some <laughs> as you uh, walk across the stage. That would be awesome. Or not. <laughs> I can only imagine the choreography that would uh, come along with that. Um, uh, sorry, it was probably selfish of me to open the door, but uh, my t-shirt under my sweatshirt is way too tight and I'm way too fat. And so I got to wear the sweatshirt and these lights are hot. Our normal lights aren't working. And so we got these funky lights here and they're warm. And so sorry, but not sorry. Um, I, need, I need that door open. Um, what was that? Very Canadian. Yeah, very sorry. Not sorry, Canadian. By the way, you... Need to meet Aaron. Aaron, this is John. This is first John, actually. You guys need to meet at some point. There you go. Yeah, he's first John. We okay. For those of you who don't know the story, um, it's actually it's funny because I uh, I sometimes have a tough time uh, encouraging people in the Sunday ten o'clock service to get involved and serve and do things. Um, they're less likely to put themselves like out there type thing, right? And so there was a day where. And we still are kind of looking for more people to usher. And um, so I, I, was, I was putting people on the spot. Who wants to usher? And John stood up. I'll usher. I'm like, okay, John. I wrote John's name down. And then another guy stood up. It was also John from the house. So I wrote down his name. And then third guy, lo and behold, he was also John. And they even stood up in the order in which they came to the house. So it was perfect. First John, second John, third John. And so, yeah, you are forever. John Reed forever. First John. Um, there you go. All right, today's message, um, I'm not going to be much of a preacher. I'm going to be more of a reader than a preacher tonight. I'm, I'm really going to read all of chapter 19 um, from the book of John, and we're getting near the end of the book of John, and I'm actually excited. Uh, for those of you who don't know, what we normally do is, is um, well, let me give you a, a different part of what we, are, what we try to do. Um, we know that this group probably will come and go. It's unusual. It's, it's wonderfully unusual when we get people, like a fellow like Tim, he is here to serve and he's a, a big part, or like Bick has been coming for years, so they will have heard this over and over again. But a lot of times we get guys for their, their time when they're at the house and then they move on to different things. And sometimes like John, they hop on a bus and they, or drive, you're driving now, aren't you? You got your car again? Yeah, so... Okay, there you go. So they come back out again. But we know that like, if we only have a little bit of time with people, it's not hard to wonder what we want to get across. What we want to do is want to introduce you to Jesus. That's the mission of SNL. We want you to be introduced to Jesus because we're crazy about him. Uh, we think he's amazing. We think he's worth following. We believe that he can save our lives, transform our, transform our lives, right? And, and so if we can do one thing, if we've only got a couple of weeks where we can present something, share something with you, we want to share Jesus. And so what we do is we teach from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we, those are called the gospel books, or they call them the gospels in, in the Bible. Four different books written by four different men, but inspired by the same Holy Spirit, to tell the life of Jesus. And so we, read, we study Matthew, we study Mark, Luke, and now we're doing John. We're just about done John. And I think we're going to do something different. It's going to require a little bit of work on my part, but um, we're going to do a mashup um, next sermon series, and we're going to teach through the life of Jesus chronologically. So we'll be drawing from all four gospel, gospels, but we're going to kind of teach through the things that happened, or, or the things that Jesus did, the things he taught, um, and we'll go through that chronologically, but it will be jumping around from book to book. Does that make sense? 
So it's, I, I, it's kind of a project I'm looking forward to, to working through, putting that together. I'm sure there's some people who've already got a head start, and so I might steal some of their work. But um, tonight we're getting close to the end of John. We're in John chapter 19. And you'll hear a lot when we talk about Jesus and tell you why we love him. One of the reasons we love him is because of what he did for us. Chapter 19 is what he did for us. This is, this is the, this is it. This is like the entire Bible is like this crescendo talking about this guy named Jesus for millennia. And then he's this promised Messiah who finally arrives. And this is what he does with his life. Now there's kind of, after that, there's a little bit of dip, but then there's a whole nother great story. It's, um, we, we hear about what happens in the New Testament church and that's really crazy and cool too. But as far as Jesus goes, this is it. When we, when we talk about the cross, this is why we talk about the cross. Not because we think it's a cool cross. We talk about what Jesus did on the cross. And before I get into the beginning of, of chapter 19, I think one of the things you need to understand is that this story begins in the third, third chapter of Genesis, the very, very first book of the Bible. Now, if you don't know about Genesis, Genesis describes the origins of the earth. And it describes what we believe to be true about how God created the heavens and the earth. And then in chapter 3, what happens is God's created beings, Adam and Eve, they take God's perfect creation and they obliterate it with sin. They destroy God's perfect paradise with sin. They introduce, sin is introduced into the world. And if you're not paying attention, what can it, it can feel like is, is God's like, oh, I've created this beautiful thing. No! Why have you done that? But what we know to be true is in that same chapter where everything gets wrecked, God reveals his plan to make it right again or to make us right with him. So in that very, he doesn't waste any time. He prophetically describes how one day, Eve's offspring would bruise his heel while it crushes the head of the serpent. And that victory that was prophesied in Genesis 3 occurs here in, in chapter 19. So I just finished telling you I'm not going to do a whole lot of extra talking, and all I've done isn't a lot of extra talking. But now I'm going to read, but what I want to do too is I'm going to interject every once in a while. Because what we've described here is that this is something that's been put into motion since the beginning of the earth. Everything has been building to this moment. And in time, God spoke to people like Brent. If, if before the Holy Spirit was available to us all, he would speak through prophets. So pretend Brent is a prophet. He would, he would give, God would say something to Brent, and then Brent's job would be to tell all of you. Does that make sense? And he would, he would tell you how to be right with God. And so what we've got is God speaking to prophets who then speak to us, and it's recorded in the Bible. And he actually prophesies, and he sets up this Messiah, this person who's going to come and save us all. So he uses guys like Isaiah, who lived... And, and was a prophet 800 years before Jesus was even born. And people like King David, who lived a 1,000 years before Jesus was born, he spoke to them, and then they either spoke or they wrote these prophetic words about what Jesus was going to do. And then one of the craziest things, if you, if you enjoy studying and, and if you enjoy kind of looking at, at what happens kind of behind the scenes, is we see over and over these things that were prophesied hundreds and sometimes a full thousand plus years earlier. They're all happening in the life of Jesus here. So let me just read and I'll try and interject when we see these things here. Okay, uh, right off the bat, chapter 19 verse 1 says, Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And even this flogging was prophesied 800 years before Jesus was even born by the prophet Isaiah. If you're writing notes, right by that word flogged, write down Isaiah 50, verse 6. So then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns 
and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. Again, this was something that was prophesied by King David a thousand years before Jesus was born. If you want to write down Psalm 69, verse 19, it describes how they made a mockery of him. So they were, they, he, Jesus was being described as the king of the Jews. That's what people were calling him. And so they're like, oh, you're a king? Well, let's get this crown of thorns and ram it into your skull. And, and see what kind of a king you are. And they put on a purple robe to kind of mock him. Goes on like this, verse 3. They came up to him saying, Hail, king of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and, and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. I'm going to keep reading. Um, Pilate said to them, Behold the man! When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Let's pause here for a second. What's happened leading up to this point is Jesus has been portrayed as a blasphemer. These are people who are, are, are quite devout and religious, and they are waiting for the Messiah that has been promised by God. They've read these same, pro these same prophecies, and so they're waiting for the one who's going to come and save, but they did not believe that Jesus was that man. And so when Jesus is being raised up as the king of the Jews, they see this as blasphemy. And blasphemy is punishable by death. So they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him, because he wasn't guilty. The Jews answer him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And even that, that point right there, that he, gave, he didn't say anything, that was prophesied, if you want to write a little note, in Isaiah 53, verse 7. So Jesus didn't say anything in his defense. Verse 10 says this. So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him. This is, I almost said ballsy, uh, but this is, uh, this is brave. That's a brave is a much better word, right? Much more Christian word. Uh, Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Verse 12, from then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Let's keep reading. Verse 13, so when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement and in Aramaic, and in Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for, of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. They're kissing up to the, the Roman leadership there. So he delivered him over to be crucified. And that, that delivering him over to be crucified... That's fulfilling the prophecy that we can read in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6 and 10. So now we get to the actual act of crucifixion where Jesus is killed on a cross. So they took Jesus, verse 17 says, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. With him with two others. And this is actually, even the fact that Jesus was not crucified by himself, that there were two other people, people who were worthy of death. Um, the fact that he was crucified with others was also prophesied in Isaiah 53, verse 12. So there they crucified him with two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Verse 19, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic. 
in Latin and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, This man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Verse 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who it shall, uh, whose it shall be. Um, even this little detail of the, the guards gambling for Jesus' tunic, this was prophesied a thousand years earlier in Psalm 22, verse 18. In fact, it says this here. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Um, if you're reading, oh, did it not work, Josiah? Oh, you just added it. Thanks, man. So even, uh, thank you. That was very cool. So when you're, when you're reading through the Bible, and you see kind of maybe some weird indentation where it's kind of, it, it's kind of pushed in a little bit, you can usually assume that that is referring back to something that was written earlier in the Old Testament, uh, a long time before, and that's the case here, where this is Psalm 22, verse 18. Let's keep going. Uh, so the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Um, let's pause there for a second. Uh, this disciple whom he loved, uh, remember this is written by John. This is the way John refers to himself. A little egotistical, I think. But um, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. And I say egotistical jokingly. Honestly, I think John felt like he was the most important person in the world to Jesus. And then if you talk to Peter, Peter probably felt like he was the most important person in the world to Jesus. And if you talk to Mary, Jesus' mother, she probably felt like she was the most important person. Do you ever meet people like that? When, when you're in a conversation with them, they're like locked in. There's, it's like nobody else is around, and they're giving you their full attention, and they, they just seem to care, and they seem to love you. And I think that's probably, oh, we see some other evidence as to why John would call himself that, but... Here we see Jesus saying to Mary, behold your son. Now, Mary actually had other sons. Jesus had these half-brothers. Um, remember that Jesus' father was God. But Jesus had other brothers who were the, the son of Mary and Joseph. But she looks at John, and she says, he says to Mary, his mother, behold your son. And then he goes on to say, um, then he said to the disciple, behold, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. And um, actually, Carolee and I had the opportunity this, this summer, uh, we were celebrating our, our 30th wedding anniversary. And one of the places we got to visit on our, on our trip, we were in, in, a, in a place in Turkey where they, um, they believed that John and Mary uh, retreated, kind of fleed to until she passed. And... He cared for her until his, his dying, or her dying day. Then we get on to verse 28, and this is talking about the death of Jesus. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. And this is something that was prophesied in Psalm, Psalm 69, verse 3. Like, like a thousand years before, that it was prophesied that he would say this. So a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Even that sour wine mentioned, that vinegar, was prophesied in Psalm 69, verse 21. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And, and that final statement was uh, prophesied in, in Psalm 22, verse 31. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So this is the end of Jesus, or the end of his, his life. Verse 31 says this. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the body would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken so that they might be taken away. 
And, and this is something that, was hap- that happened not just to Jesus. Um, the next day was the Sabbath, and they weren't allowed to do work. They weren't allowed to bring these bodies down on the Sabbath. And so it would be more convenient for these Jews in their worship. They wanted them to die faster. And so when they're up on this cross with their, with their feet nailed, they could actually use their legs to, to relieve some of the pressure on their hands and, and allow them to breathe a little bit easier. So they lived longer. And so if you wanted them to die faster, they would come after all the other stuff they'd done. They'd come and they'd break their legs so they were fully hanging on their hands and they couldn't breathe like they needed to breathe. And they would die quicker. And they needed to, them to die quick, more quickly so that they could, to satisfy religious practices, take him down off the cross before the Sabbath started. So this was their plan. Um, so the soldiers came and they broke the legs of the first and the other who had been crucified him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. Now in this little, these couple statements here, three different prophecies are fulfilled. Um, first of all, not one of his bones will be broken was prophesied in Exodus. That's the second book of the Bible, Exodus twelve forty six. 46. Uh, they pierced his side with a spear. That's something that was prophesied in uh, Zechariah 12.10. And the significance of the blood and the water both coming out, which was prophesied in, in Psalm 22.14, uh, it, it describes how his heart had ruptured. He literally had a broken heart. That's, that's what was symptomatic of the blood and the water coming out of his side after it was pierced. Verse 35 says, He who saw it, has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him who they have pierced. Even this this statement where they just take a moment and they're looking at this Jesus who has died on the cross. That was prophesied in, uh, in Psalm 22, verse 17. Here we are on the last stretch. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was the disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the, of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Even the tomb and the, the circumstances of the tomb, that was prophesied in Isaiah 53, verse 9. Um, that's the end of chapter 19. So the way the story ends today, Jesus has lived this, per- I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here. Um, Jesus has lived this perfect life. He's done all these amazing miracles. He's taught these mind blowing things and he gave himself to be crucified on the cross. Again, I, I think it's really important for us to understand that Jesus was never a victim He was not ambushed and captured and and then crucified. Jesus knew, he he prophesied, uh, and um, he knew what was going to happen. He knew what was coming, and he chose to enter Jerusalem knowing that he was going to his death. And he did all these things to fulfill this prophetic plan, but also because he knew what the will of the Father was. Just a couple chapters ago, We see Jesus praying to God, God, if I don't have to do this, please, let's find another way. Jesus was being real with his father. If if there's any other way, because he knew what this was going to be all about. This wasn't just, just physical torture. It was emotional. He was being made fun of and, and ridiculed. But it was spiritual torture. Because he took on the weight of all of our sin. 
when he was crucified on the cross. So when we talk about what Jesus did for us, that, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about what he did on the cross. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing this song, and then I'm just going to wrap up by elaborating the significance and, and what it means. Now that we know that Jesus is, has died for us, why did he die? What, what was accomplished at the cross? And I'll, I'll try and sum that up really quickly after we respond to worship. Let's stand and let's sing the song together, and uh, then I'll say one more last thing.
have a quick seat. Thank you, worship team. Um, I want to tie things up, hopefully a neat little bow. And I'm going to try and do it quickly, but I want to be thorough as well. If the story of Jesus was that he lived and that he died, he was a great teacher, did some cool miracles, but if that was the end of the story, then he'd just be a, a great man. Actually, no, I don't even know that would work. But it, it would be incomplete. Um, spoiler alert, next week we're going to find out that he rises from the dead. He defeats death. He demonstrates that he's not just Lord here on earth, that he is Lord of even the realms and principalities of, of life and death. Nothing is is over beyond him and outside of his purview and power. And it, it's, it's incredible. But really, if, if we don't know why he did this, we really miss the whole point of the story of Jesus. <clears throat> since Genesis chapter 3, since the beginning of time when, when sin came into the world, the Father has been pursuing us recklessly after us because he loves us. He wants to be in relationship with us. What happens is be my sin creates a barrier, is this, this space between me and God. Because you've got to understand, God is, is perfect, and I'm not, right? And, and because I'm imperfect, because of my sin, because of the things I've done wrong, I can't be in the presence of a perfect God. But he wants to be with me. He wants me to be with him desperately. And so way back in Genesis 3, he made a plan, and his plan was to send his son to take care of, to, to, to deal with all of that sin and grossness that I caused so that I could be right before God, so that I could be made right before God. So when Jesus was crucified on the cross, what he did is, and there's a, a beautiful parallel that I don't have time to get into, um, they're, they're celebrating the Passover at this time, and, and there's this Jewish tradition called the Passover lamb. And Jesus became the sacrificial lamb where all of the sin was taken on by Jesus. And when I say all the sin, I mean all of the sin was taken on by Jesus. He took it all on. And by dying on the cross for us, he paid the price completely. He paid the debt of our sin. And so, hopefully this is something that's intriguing to you. Like, oh, how do I get my sin paid for? Well, let me tell you. That, that sounds like I'm like trying to sell you something. But that's, that's not what I mean. The first step is to, first of all, acknowledge that you have a sin problem. The first thing, I'm not going to get help from Jesus if I think I'm fine on my own. If I think I'm perfect, I don't need Jesus. So the first step is to come to this point and acknowledge, admit that I have a problem with sin. Then the second thing is to believe that this Jesus we've just talked about here, that he did what he said he did. That he paid the price for my sin problem. He paid that debt of death for me so that I wouldn't have to. So if you believe that, and if you're ready, because we're all kind of on a pathway to hell. We're walking towards our death, and the enemy's using every tool at his disposal to try and drag us or lure us to our death. And he wants us to die in the most horrific way possible and take as many people with us as possible. And so if the, the, the next part is we can't just keep walking towards death. We need to turn away from that sin. Give that sin to Jesus to take care of. Turn away from it and commit to following him. And so this is the invitation that comes out of what Jesus did in, in John chapter 19. And so I want to present that invitation to you in the form of prayer. If you wouldn't mind bowing your heads, closing your eyes, I, I want to invite you into something. Uh, the reason we get you to bow your heads and close your eyes is because this first step is something that really is, is mostly between you and Jesus. Uh, later, if, if you choose to be bapti baptized, which we hope you would, uh, that's something a little bit more public. But right now, 
if you're ready, if you know that you've got a sin problem, if you're ready to admit your brokenness and your sinfulness, and if you, if you honestly believe that Jesus died as, as a, a sacrifice to take on all of that sin, to pay the debt that you owe because of your sin, so that you could be right with God, if you believe that, and if you're ready to commit your life to following Him, I would invite you, you know, tonight we're going to get you to raise your hand. If you, would, if you would raise your hand, if that's something you want to decide tonight, that you admit your sin, you believe that Jesus paid the price for your sin, you're ready to commit your life to following Jesus, I would invite you to raise your hand tonight. Awesome, I see your hands, yeah. You can put your hands down. Heavenly Father, we know that you see those hands. And more than that, we know that you see their hearts. And, and we, we know that, that you see the, the person who is at the end of the rope and they've tried everything. And, and, and they're ready to try this. They're ready to commit to following you. To turning from their sin and following you. And Father, we know that this is the beginning of a, of a beautiful road. At, wh when people make this decision, they are justified before the Father. So justification happens right now. There's, there's no application process. There's no other steps. But then now we know, Father, that you begin the work of sanctification where you start, you're starting to make us to be more like you. And it's not always going to be smooth. But, Father, we're so grateful that you invite us to enter into that journey and walk towards you and with you. And, Father, tonight I just pray a prayer of blessing on each of the people here tonight and, and those who might be listening online. We pray a prayer of peace. That tonight there would be a peace that doesn't necessarily make sense. They would know that they've been visited by the, the Most High God. That the Holy Spirit is, has brought peace into their life. Because they can, they can feel it. They, they know it. They, they know that there's something, there's something happening. That peace is, is coming from somewhere that isn't themselves. And we pray that would lead to a great sleep tonight and a great day tomorrow. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Bless you guys. Um, for those of you who are going to be here tomorrow, we're going to have a fun one. Oh, I did want to say one thing. Um, tomorrow it's going to be packed. So uh, I, incur I think I've mentioned this before. I encourage you to sit all over the place. In fact, find somebody, find somebody like my mom and dad or, or somebody that you, you want to get to know their story and, and share your story with them. But if you can sit closer together or aim to get more into the middle of the rows instead of on the aisles, That'll just make it easier for us to pack all the people. It's going to be a busy day tomorrow. Yes, John. No, I'm putting all the chairs out tonight. Like every chair we own is going to be out tonight. Yeah, so you're not going to worry about that. All right. Bless you guys. Take care.